Hello to all, this is Rhyme, also known as Rhythm Game Addict, and I am making a rare in-camera appearance for a special occasion. My YouTube channel has hit 500 subscribers. It's been around for more than a decade now, so it's not a meteoric rise, but it's still a nice milestone, so I figured I should do something cool. Now, if you've been following the channel, you know that I am quite a follower of the music charts, particularly billboards, and also the music critic community. And as a result, I tried my hand last year at making a worst list akin to them on the on the Popheads subreddit. It got mixed reception, but it did encourage me to try again, though I ended up sliding into not completing it by the time that list season was really relevant. However, because I've hit this milestone, I decided that I will present it in vlog format. And unlike last year, it won't just be the worst hits, it'll also be the best. Though I know what gets the engagement going, so I'm going to start with the worst. I've prepared uh, some, some cue cards just to keep myself on point, but overall this is going to be essentially unscripted. Hopefully it works. As a bit of a lead-in, when I do these year-end rankings, I rate the songs out of 10. 8s or higher are considered for the best list, while 4s or lower are considered for the worst list. Last year, only two 4 out of 10s made it to the list proper while two songs were abysmal enough to get two out of tens. This year, there are none of the latter, and the fours have a considerably larger swath of the list, so that's already a marked improvement. I don't have as much bile for the list as I did last year. Which is good, because that was one of the big criticisms that that list got. With that out of the way, though, let's get to the dishonorable mentions. First up is Life is Good by Future featuring Drake. Now, I find Drake's part to be pretty solid. He has some memetic lines, and the beat work is chilled and yet assertive. However, Future's part is rather lousy. His bars are not memorable, and the beat is rather deadened. But the worst part is the transition not being existent, essentially, and the lack of any interplay between the two parts. Then there's Chasing You by Morgan Wallen. Now, sonically, the song is pleasant, if not impressive, but the real problem for me is the lyrics, because... The narrator just comes across as hopelessly, irrationally obsessed with the with the woman, to the point that he points out that he has either a fiance or a wife, and yet he's still pining through this woman and trying to be, trying to woo her through his music. It just comes across really creepy. Next up is "For the Night" by Pop Smoke featuring Lil Baby and Da Baby. While I know this is somewhat true for a fair bit of his posthumous output. This one in particular felt like a plunder to me. It seemed like he only had a hook and half a verse prepared, and I would have been okay with that hook being sampled as a feature on another artist's song, perhaps even Lil Baby and Dub Baby, though not with these lyrics. Thematically, they don't really gel together. But what I really find troublesome is the way they marketed it. Having Pop Smoke as the lead credit lets them have their cake and eat it too. It justifies having it on the, his final LP, which was hyped throughout the year and kept the song very high on streaming. But also having those popular artists featured on what essentially amounts to a snippet of a song, it made it more enticing to radio, which just feels cynical to me. And the final dishonorable mention is Party Girl by Stay Solid Rocky. Honestly, there's not too much to say about this one. The beat work is somehow both brick walling and yet underweight at the same time, Stay Solid Rocky's bars are rather underdeveloped, and his performance is so aided by autotune that it comes to no surprise that he's likely to be a one-hit wonder. It's honestly kind of pitiable. So now we get to the worst list proper, starting off at number 10 with One Margarita by Luke Bryan. Now Luke's work in general is a mixed bag to me. His material tends to be rather corny and sometimes outright body, but the instrumentation can be fun and energetic enough to overcome such deficiencies. However, in this case, it fails in both departments. The production in general is not helping, as it leaves the percussion rather tinny, and what little melody is there is just insufficient. It reminds me in that regard of one of his past singles, Kick the Dust Up. As to the lyrics, they're not the most interesting thing, but they'd be inoffensive in a void. But the problem is that in this time, to have a song about partying out, um, just having like this big beach gathering, 
it just rings weird. And I know it was recorded before lockdown, well before lockdown, but it's still the fact that they kept promoting it on on the radio and made it a hit in this year. It just doesn't feel right. But the bigger problem that I have with the vocals is the production. It's a multi-track type of uh, type deal, but the lower voice they they gave it like this resonance that just makes the whole thing just sound so unflattering. I'm not fond of it. Then at number nine is the remix of Suicidal by YNW Melly and Juice World. Now, if the original song was the hit, I would not consider this worthless material. It's edgy stuff with a love gone sour being blamed for the narrator's self-destructive behavior. But the beatwork is solid, and the narrative is at least cohesive. It reminds me of YNW Melly's previous hit, Murder on My Mind, in that regard. However, adding Juice World to the song, which is a posthumous credit, it feels like a plunder to me. And I'll need a bit of explanation for that. Because unlike Pop Smoke's song that I mentioned previously, Juice's contributions here do feel complete. The problem is that they sat on it for several months, perhaps more than a year. Because while this works... Well, with his 2018 material, like Lucid Dreams and Awkward are the same, with this sort of egocentric buck-passing material, by 2019, Juice's writing was no longer really reflecting that. It was becoming more self-aware with songs like Robbery. And he had been, in behind the scenes, he was recording a lot of stuff that was reflecting his sort of progression as a person. And quite a bit of this material would end up being on his posthumous project. The fact that they released this remix so close to his death, I think they were aware that, that that album being released would change the conversation about Juice WRLD as an artist, and they wanted to cash in on the persona that was more familiar to people before it would become irrelevant. And that just feels so opportunistic to me. Next up at number eight is Stuck With You by Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber. Now, while One Margarita was hampered by being marketed during the pandemic, this was a song that was explicitly trying to address the pandemic. And in doing so, it completely failed in a rather toxic manner. At this point, reports were already coming in about the increase in stress, cabin fever, mental health issues, and the resulting uptick in domestic disputes. And the thing is, the song looked at that, cast it all aside, and decided to romanticize it. The main idea of the song is basically... This lockdown, it can't keep going on. The pandemic can take the world further into hell, and it won't matter because we love each other so much. If anything, the lockdown having us in the same house, it strengthened our relationship, which just feels both so out of touch to have as a message in a big hit song, but also just completely insipid. And speaking of insipid, so is the instrumentation. It's a rehash of Ed Sheeran's Perfect, but where that song had some organic flair with the piano, and the violins. This song just has a robotic, turgid set of drum fills, some bland organ chords on the hook, and a rather boring guitar tone. It doesn't even come close to making it for the song, at least as an audio experience. At number seven is the remix of What's Poppin' by Jack Harlow featuring The Baby, Tory Lanez, and Lil Wayne. Now, you may have noticed that this isn't the first song on this list thanks to its remix, and spoiler alert, it won't be the last, but this one in particular stings for me because I consider the original to be best list material. The debut single of Jack Harlow, it shows off his technical skill along with Ernest's songwriting that helps give him a distinct flavor. However, a lot of that's lost in this remix. His bars have been completely rewritten, now about how the original song has springboarded his career. Now, because this version of the song became the dominant one, especially on radio, I can't help but think that for a casual listener, this must have come across as the cocky musings of a one-hit wonder, bringing to mind uh, Mims' 2007 hit, This Is Why I'm Hot. Jack peppers in some self-deprecating humor, but it comes across as very postured on, in this posse cut of the context, and it's also undercut by DaBaby being far more unabashed with his flexing of, with his fame. He also dates the song quite a bit by referencing the success of his current single, Rockstar, which is, at this point, long gone. A lot of Jack's original bars have been adapted for Lil Wayne's verse, but a lot of the re relatability was because of Jack's status as a rookie. They, the, vi the vibe does not come across the same when you have a rapper who's been at it for two more than two decades now, especially when he doesn't deliver it all that well. 
it kind of hurts because of the current events, but the rapper who comes across the best in this posse cut is Tory Lanez, and his part does not come close to saving it. It's bloated, it's a bit of a mess, and I'm especially bitter because the original song would have been a hit big enough to make the year end. It's just that this remix ended up supplanting it completely in terms of popularity. It's been taking a couple of days to prepare this video, as you've probably noticed from my numerous shirt changes. So I've decided to be a little more concise with the rest of the entries on this worst list. If you've been following any of the videos from the list season, you've probably come across a good couple of these elaborated in better detail than I could, so it's not like you'll be missing too much. One that I didn't see on other lists, though, was my number six, Slide by Her featuring YG. Now, I wasn't really a fan of Her in the past. Um, her slow, moody R&B was never really my cup of tea. But I knew that she had an audience, she was a critical darling, and I understood her core appeal. However, this was what crossed over to the Hot 100, a very dual intuition move, having a trend chasing sound and swapping out the more thoughtful writing for a lot of basic tropes that attempt to be excused by an ironic veneer. Unfortunately, a lot of that's conveyed with a monotone delivery that just comes across as bored and somewhat snooty. Her follow-up hit that carried over into the 2021 year and might be challenging for the year end, though possibly doubtfully, Damage, was one that finally clicked with me, and it's much more true to her overall sound, so it just makes this song feel even more cynical in contrast. And number five is Intentions by Justin Bieber featuring Quavo. It's got a wonderful beat that is completely misused by the performers. Trying to do such speedy flows, that's not what this sort of beat is designed for. It's um, it's much more in tune for something like a chill wave artist, like possibly Botsy. And the thing is that the bars themselves are just loaded with groaners. Number four is ILY by Surf Mesa featuring Emily. Now for most people this was just a dishonorable mention on this season, but for me this gets way under my skin because as a dance fan, I hate how it makes the scene look absolutely lazy. Can't Take My Eyes Off You deserves a lot better and has gotten a lot better from DanceX in the past. I would like to point you to the Boys Town Gang disco cover instead. Number three is Someone You Love by Louis Capaldi. Yes, this was bigger in the 2020 chart year than it was in 2019, and so at this point it's been absolutely picked clean of any meat on its bones by the critic community. And so all I really have to say is that Before You Go being the follow-up single and being leagues better just further points out just how insufficient this song is. Number two is Memories by Maroon 5. Now I am a sucker for a good song that uses the Canon D progression. Some of my favorite songs are Hook by Blues Traveler and Out of My Head by Fastball. However, a song just taking the lead melody from Canon D to be the chorus, that just feels lazy to me. And in addition, the song essentially being a congratulatory victory lap for the band, or at this point basically Adam Levine with how spare this production is, along with the cheering crowd uh, throughout about half of the song, it brings to mind the worst part of Seven Years by Lucas Graham, except stretched out to a whole song, Joy. And the number one, in my opinion, worst song on the 2020 Hot 100 year end is I Hope specifically the remix by Gary Barrett featuring Charlie Puth. Song utterly butchers its narrative just in order to jam pack Charlie Puth in to get that pop crossover, which it absolutely succeeded in. And to me, it's emblematic of the worst elements of the meta hit um, chasing that happened, especially in 2020. So that's the worst list. I'm sorry that ended up a bit anticlimactically. I wasn't expecting it, but I hope ended up being on quite a number of worst lists at that top spot, and as a result, it was explained quite uh, quite better than ever I could. The best list should come within the next week or so. Um, I was expecting to do these two parts as one single video, but uh, with how long this has taken, I think uh, it will be more expedient for me to release it while the 500 subscriber mark is a bit more recent.